Yeah, hi, my name is Wolfgang Richter. I'm from Austria. I'm here today to talk to you about uh, the Merco Insurance Company and their journey towards Scrum first and then less. Like Alexei already asked me, this company is about 220 years old. It's one of Austria's largest insurance companies. So, I mean, if you consider that. I, I will tell you much more uh, like a story today. It's not so much of a workshop, but whenever you have a question, whenever something comes to your mind, don't wait for the end of the talk, just interrupt me. That's pretty okay. If we don't make it through all the slides, I think we can agree that this is also okay, okay? We have a time box of how many? 45 minutes? For the, uh, you are my timekeeper today. <laughs> Great, <laughs> thanks for that. So. 45 minutes in total, whatever we can talk about within this period, we'll talk about it, okay? So like I said, uh, this is an insurance company, 220 years old. If you're working with such an environment, then um, you need to figure out first of all, at which state are they? Are they? I mean, what I did first uh, when I went there was a little bit of an analysis, uh, how many employees are involved in this transition, what is the entire organization, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the standard stuff, right? Um, the reason why they wanted to start going from very traditional processes to agile processes, like Scrum in the, in the beginning, was they had a very major pain point. They tried to replace a legacy system three times. <laughs> over a period of 12 years. At least that was the story I was told there when I was hired. Um, over 12 years, they failed three times and they hired external partners, et cetera, et cetera. So the experts for insurance company platforms, things like that. But, never, but in the end, it never um, turned out to be a success. It, they always had to go back to the beginning, think it over and start from scratch once again. I mean they made one mistake, one big mistake. I think it's in one of the latest slides, but I don't care about so much about the slides. <laughs> it's just a, a companion for me. Um, they started creating all these traditional requirements documents, you can imagine, right? They had one document which was about 400 pages thick. So, it's not a lot, okay, that's good. For me, it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I have other examples too, but in that case, I mean, 400 pages for requirements, you need to have the time first to read through that and then understand it and then process it. That's just not what we're doing in an agile fashion and even in a traditional fashion, it's, it's ah, not the best way to do it. So when I went there and when they started talking to me, hey, we have this big uh, analysis done up front, we had this big requirements document, we have all that in place already. Here it is. We want you to work with us because we want to do it in an agile fashion now. You explain to us how it works. You become the scrum master of the team and the agile coach for the enterprise and so on. And we use that. Okay, I started reading through it. I read the first 10 to 20 pages. And then what do you think what I did? Yeah. In the round basket. It ended up there. And they thought, I'm nuts. Hey, we invested so much time, so much money, so much energy in this analysis. We have gone through that. So many people were involved. We need to use that. You know, the sunken cost fallacy, this, this fallacy of we have invested a lot, so it has to be worth something. It was worth nothing because my next question to them was, okay, you ha we have that. If we use that, what was the outcome the last three times? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, this started the thinking process, right? Still, they thought I was nuts. Um, in the beginning, we didn't work with a large-scale Scrum environment. We started with just Scrum with one team who was um, uh, considered to replace this legacy system. Like I said, they failed three times over a period of 12 years. They involved many of these people around down here. I mean, all the, the experts from the other departments, sales, uh, working agent, uh, uh, sales agents, also customer, uh, representatives, all these people from the other departments were somehow involved and they didn't want to talk to the IT department anymore. It was just a gap between those two. Communication was completely broken. There was nothing existing in terms of a healthy working environment between those two areas. So we had to start reinstalling that. 
Um, we started in 2012, so it's about six years ago that they really started this journey and made the decision, yes, we want to be agile, we want to become agile. Like said already, we started with Scrum, so one single team, and it was their first try with agile methods. Of course, they went to conferences, workshops, courses, read books, etc., etc., but no practical experience. Some of the employees from uh, in, in different, in other jobs, in previous jobs, had some connection to agility already, uh, but more like that. So we really had to work from scratch there. Um, and it was, of course, a major change in their, in their working habits. I said 220 years. And some of these processes really felt as old as the company itself, right? They were, I'm pretty sure they were installed in the very beginning of this organization and later on never changed. So, um, and of course we had all the resistance in there. So like said, hey, we are working here for 25 years or 30 years already. I mean, this is a pretty stalled, pretty stable environment. People stay there for their lifetime until they retire, right? To tell somebody, after 25 years of being an expert in their environment, in their job, hey, we do everything differently now. Do you think that's gonna work? Shaking heads, no. Do you think I said that to them? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, because that would be my next step out of the door then. No, that's, that's not what, I, that's definitely something I don't do as a coach. I don't go there and tell people, we change everything, you need to work completely differently, no. The, the message is, is much more what comes from uh, from fields like Buddhism, Zen, etc., martial arts. We want to work. Ever, anyone here uh, familiar with uh, martial arts? Kung Fu, probably. Yeah, which one? Karate. Karate. Okay. Uh, in Karate, as far as I'm familiar with it, it's not so much about the energy of the opponent. In Kung Fu, it's much more you work with the energy of the component, the power, the force. So you don't. Aikido, for example, yes, definitely. So this is much more the, the theory I use, the, the principle I use. Work with the energy, with the, the power, the force, people bring along with their experience. Because if they work 25 years in this environment, they are the experts of the environment, not me. I can't tell them how to change it. I can use their experience, I can use their wisdom, their knowledge, right? That's very important at the very beginning for me. Um, when we started, and this was something I will never forget because this was, uh, I'm in this, in this job for many years now, uh, and as a trainer I tell many different stories, but this one I, I love to tell in courses and also in, at conferences because it was such an inspiring experience for me. Um, we started there when I, you know, I said we had this requirements document and it ended up in the trash bin, right? So we started with zero requirements. There was a legacy system, but we didn't want to copy the legacy system. We wanted to build something better, something more modern, something more, yeah, whatever technology brings along that will be there for the next 10 years or so, something like that at least. So we had zero requirements. We had to start the very first sprint from scratch without knowing what we really need to do. That means we started with the requirements process. We started analyzing, uh, an analysis process. We created three user stories. Yes, we used user stories. It's not part of Scrum, of course, but it's something which works pretty good. We started with three user stories and two of them we implemented. What do you think it was? Two user stories. Hmm? No, not a log. I never start with login. That's the worst situation, the worst scenario you can imagine because login is useless. It has a very little value. Hmm? Yeah, we're at an insurance company and you need to consider what they do there is they calculate tariffs, right? They do a lot of mathematics. So what we did was, and this were two user stories, we had this entry field, so where we could enter some amount of value. We're talking about life insurances here. Then there was this button, like calculate or something it was called, I can't remember exactly. And then there was the result of this calculation yeah, for the tariff. That's all that was there. I mean, I told you the change, uh, the, the agents, the departments and IT, they were just really, really separated. They didn't want to talk. So we 
got one of these head of the departments from the life insurance uh, area to work with us. And they said, yeah, I will come to your review, I will help you, I will give you a little bit of feedback, but with very much resistance. And everything we showed to her in the review was exactly that. What was her reaction? What do you think? <laughs> no, it was exactly the opposite. Yeah, it was like, I never will forget this sentence. How did you do that? <laughs> really, seriously, it was how did you do that? Why? Because 12 years, rem remember, she worked for 12 years with the IT department without any usable something. And now we had an entry field, a calculation, and the result was correct. She did that by hand then. She, she checked it, right? And it was correct. And <laughs> her sentence was really, how did you do that? She was so fascinated that after two weeks, there's a result, and it's correct, and it's working, and she could use it. I mean, it's not much, of course. It's not a minimal viable pro uh, product, but it's working. It's correct. Fascinating. She was really fascinated by that. And from the next sprint on, what do, do you think happened then? Sorry? <laughs> we built two fields, yeah. Now the fascinating thing was the dynamics in the organization. It completely changed. So this communication was reinstalled. She then asked, hey, I have another 10 minutes. Do you need feedback to something? Because we provided then the staging environment, uh, uh, an environment they uh, were able to play around with all the time whenever they were, uh, when they had another 10 minutes. And she really did that. And she involved other colleagues. They started to work with her. her and they started now pushing actually the IT department, the developers. Hey, we have time, we want something to try out. What do you have for us? How can we help you? It was a completely different situation just by this one sprint with a correct minimal result of something. Correct and it's working, right? This was really fascinating and I really enjoyed it. We had then uh, the first major release out there after six months and that means it really went into production. So there were enough calculations, not just one field, <laughs> many more, and many more algor algorithms behind that, and they really started using that. The entire journey for the replacement took two years for the legacy system, but after six years it was really in production, and continuously, incrementally updated, and yeah, like it is supposed to be in Scrum. And that, of course, made them think, if that's working that well already, and if it helps us to communicate better in the organization. What would be the next step for us? Is there something beyond Scrum? Is there something we can then probably use um, to work with all the five teams? There were five teams in the development department. You have to com uh, consider that IT was also separated into operations and uh, development. And it still is. So this journey is not completely over. They are slowly changing, but they are changing. That's the good thing. Yeah, they already started about thinking, how can we involve operations? And they got some concepts, ideas, and so on, but they didn't do it yet. Uh, also because um, some, some key players changed a lot. So over the last five years, I, get, I guess they have the third head of ID now, so which doesn't help to have a continuous flow in the change, right? <coughs> But I thought about, what about scaling? So we have five teams now, we have five development teams. We have many different systems, like I think they have 37 something systems in the background which need to cooperate so that this uh, entire system is working end to end. So there is nothing like, uh, or this, this comes to the myth that everybody needs to understand everything, but nobody can understand 70, uh, 37 different kind of systems. It's impossible. So how can we scale? How can we have these cross-functional teams then? How can we have all that kind of things that work in Scrum in a single team already, but at a larger scale? And of course, the next logical step, and that was their fault that they hired me because I'm a less trainer, so I was already uh, at this time very much involved with less. We started to think about less, large-scale Scrum, which is for me the next logical step, right? Because Large-scale Scrum is Scrum is one of the principles. There is nothing different to Scrum. It's just a little bit more than just Scrum, right? And what about the rest of the organization? So, 
Of course, we started with this open space sessions. We started to involve many other people, not just from the life insurance, but uh, uh, whatever kind of uh, other areas they had, uh, social insurances, home insurances, whatever, whatever, whatever. They all got involved, even if they didn't get a feature. They started coming to reviews just to think and learn what the other departments do. And to get new ideas, new innovations out of the door for their, their riffs, for their fields and so on. So they created some kind of synergy. It created some kind of synergy effect across the other departments, which was really great to see. They weren't involved yet. That came two years later then that they started getting features, but uh, it really worked out well. By the way, <laughs> in the replacement of the legacy system, we found out that one of the systems was for 20 years calculating something wrong which was interesting. <laughs> I mean, it was not a serious flaw, it was just a minor flaw, so nothing for the, really for the customers, it didn't really matter, but we figured it out. So this was the kind of transparency that, that was created behind that, right? Um, the journey, I just open up all the, the, the bullet points. We had a workshop with the head of ID and head of software development for the next steps. Because if we talk about less, one of the essential things you need to know is what is your product, right? Less is really created around the product and it has to be customer centric. They thought much more in terms of solutions, like we have these 37 systems, so people are separated by systems, like in components or modules or whatever you want to call it. But now they were forced to think differently. What do we have in common? What is the problem behind that? What is our product? And this was one of the very first workshops we did, the product definement. Uh, the environments you mean from a technical standpoint? Theoretically, yes, but it was never used. So, I mean, if the host group, like people working with the very old technology and the other ones which were working with Java and uh, the modern technology, they didn't see any reason to connect at this level, right? We started from the problem, not from the tools or so. The tools were secondary. Primary is to identify what was the problem. Here we had a life insurance and we knew, okay, from a, from a technology standpoint, from a stack, there's much involved, many different systems. So this calculation goes through down to the host and comes back up to the UI, which is then a very modern kind of thing. So that was really the different kind of... Uh, viewpoint they had to create because until then they just looked at their separated maybe one person was able to uh, do this for three systems and so on so but now we had to create this end-to-end -end view on it so going away from this technology perspective more towards the problem perspective right and that was also the reason why they didn't connect at the technology level because they didn't see a reason but if we talk about the problem level and the product level they have to connect because it's just one process, yeah, end-to-end -end use case, you can call it. Yeah. Of course, if we start a journey, they wanted to know what are the risks if we fail, like in traditional project management, traditional risk management, I always do that, a risk analysis. Do we have the time to do it? Do we have the money to do it? Are some other things at stakes? Can we involve customers? All these questions, they need to be clarified up front. And if we do it, first of all, why do we want to do it? So what's the reason? Yeah, because the others do it, that's not an answer. Then it, for me, it's full stop. But what are the chances? What's the value we want to create? So the benefits, who are the stakeholders? What are the processes involved? And what kind of limitations do we have? Can we? reduce the 37 systems, again from a technology standpoint, to 20. Is this possible at this moment or not? Can we 
have cross-functional teams which have a full view on the full stack, things like that. These are the limitations. And of course, in such an environment, you have some of these limitations. Like the teams are not fully cross-functional. They are still a little bit focused on some technology area, but they are much more cross-functional than they were before, right? And what are the goals? What can we measure? What do we want to reach? Very important. So, the main goals, which are pretty common to everybody actually in every journey is we want more flexibility and we want to be focused a little bit more because they had so much multitasking going on there, right? Everybody wanted everything at the same time. Because, <laughs> why do we need flexibility is a very good question. I would prefer stability actually, <laughs> because it's much more convenient. But on the other hand, if you look at the surroundings, everything around us changes so much. The market changes, even in the insurance environment. Technology changes so fast. Uh, they were used to work with the clients on a personal uh, contact basis, right? They didn't consider, and this, that this journey was started about two years ago, they didn't consider that people nowadays want to uh, do the basic stuff online and only where there is an expert needed on a personal contact basis, right? Things like that, that changes a lot. Even in insurance, everywhere else is uh, the same. Maybe not at the same speed, yeah? And probably we could discuss what amount of flexibility is required. But flexibility is definitely required. So that you do the same thing for 50 years is simply not no, uh, possible anymore. They did that before, right? Does this answer your question? Yeah. Like I said, more focus. Oops, that was the wrong button. More focus. Because multitasking really slowed them down so much. And this is a journey that this is still going on. It's still many different, I said 800 people in the entire organization and 50 people developing that in the product group then. So this kind of let's keep the focus is really tough. They hired um, a product owner, like you could call it an overall product owner or chief product owner, whatever term you want to use, which was responsible to consolidate all the different requests. The problem with that was this guy was new to the organization. So he had to learn for about six months first what's going on there before he was accepted by the other departments that he is the one who consolidates that and says stop or we do it or we don't do it, right? They still have a board in the background. This is one of the compromises we have. Board of stakeholders from other departments who says yes, we have the budget for that or we don't have the budget for that. And this is fully okay, even in less, I would say. If there is a single source of truth in the end, which is a common product backlog. They didn't have that. This was one of the bigger changes there. Um, and of course, communication aspects like across teams and so on, but I don't want to go too far into that because that's more the basic stuff for cross-functional, uh, cross-team cooperation. So, decisions. Scaling, yes. Large-scale Scrum, yes. Software development only for now, not operations like said already, still go on going on this journey. And we work with those customers who are really willing to help. I mean, I, say I had this term stakeholders on the board uh, on one of the slides, right? We do traditional stakeholder identification and management, right? That means we separate that, uh, them in the four quadrants and identify those who have really something to say, like making decisions and are willing to help, uh, making decisions are not willing to help, not making decisions willing to help, which is also good, and then are those which are not making decisions and not willing to help, so like contradicting everything you say, etc. We call them vampires and we really want to keep them away from the project. So we did in the beginning that it's not too much of a, a hassle, uh, select the customs, customers we wanted to work with. So it's a quadrant. It's not a matrix, but we have a categorization, yes. Yeah. Um, and like said, some of these old processes, they will probably never ever go away, right? 
<laughs> it's just they are there, they are set in stone, you can't change them. Accept it. <laughs> if you try, you just focus only on these processes and lose the focus of what really creates value and benefit in the end. So, oops. Oh, it's jumping around. Uh, like I said, one of the workshops was that we identified a product, and there it's not just a, pr it's not really a product, it's a service they provide, right, to the rest of the organization. So we had to cr figure out what it really is and what is the main message behind that. Not mission or vision, it's just the message behind that, what they create, what they can order from this IT department. And this was then the long sentence they created. It now was refurbished two times. Um, it's a little bit simpler now, it's a little bit more focused now, but it started the journey and this was really good. So they got in their focus, they really identified those things that can go into a productive uh, backlog and those that can't, which is really, really important, right? So, um, before less, there were some changes in mani uh, management functions, like I said, and they had also a rebranding campaign, which didn't really help in the transition. No, <laughs> not really, because it uh, did cost, of course, a lot of energy. They had not only to focus on the transition, but to do something else, like uh, the branding, the CI, everything had to change in parallel. This was not really good for us, but yeah, it just slowed down the process a little bit. It didn't stop it. That was the good aspect, right? And they wanted, the c but there's also something positive behind that because um, they wanted to have this more modern, more younger, more fresh image to the outside, right? And what can be more modern and more fresh than becoming agile, right? <laughs> so this was good. This was a good synergy. Um, yeah, so, oh, there it is. The, at the beginning, we didn't have the product owner, so somebody had, else had to jump in. We called it a fake product owner situation. So two department heads and one of the, the head of IT, they were pretty much a board, and they made the decisions for the product backlog until the guy was really up to speed and was able to be the product owner. Um, we, of course, did all the trainings in the beginning because it's not just people, here is the book and here's your scrum master, do scrum. I've never seen that working, but I've seen so often organizations trying to do that, which is stupid. I mean, if I ask somebody, you're, what's your name? <laughs> Elena. What's your profession? Project manager. So from tomorrow on, you're Java developer, <laughs> but you don't get any training. Would you accept that? Yes, no. Yeah, nobody would accept that. I mean, to make it more obvious, if somebody is told uh, tomorrow you're flying airplanes, yeah, the big ones, the jumbos, no training, read a book. <laughs> nobody would fly with you, I guess. But in, in an organization, it's always like, hey, we're doing Scrum tomorrow, you don't know the rules, read the book, read the 17 pages or 19 in English, and do it. That's stupid. That's really stupid. So there, it was good, we said, okay, we need the training, they accepted that, they invested in that, and they did it then much better than I've seen otherwise, uh, some uh, elsewhere. Yes, um, the organizational structure. I already talked about that, I want to jump over to here. We had the head of IT, a head of development, a head of operations, and then we had some other group, and this was pretty much the group that was involved in the very beginning. So the first team was from here, for Scrum, and for less, it was then pretty much this one. Operations was involved, but not fully, like I said. That's, I don't know how fast they were really involved, that there's now another approach. Uh, whether they will really become something like DevOps or in the end, I think that's one of the less flexible aspects they have in the organization, I would call it, yeah. So, we had an update of product definition. We have only one anymore, and it's not a product definition per se, as we want to have it in less. It's a service description, right? And less also works with service descriptions. So if somebody is asking himself, uh, we're always talking about products, product, products, but we don't have a product. We have customers and we create individual software and on a project basis, that's no contradiction to less. 
that's working. It's just a, not a product definition, it's a service definition then in the end, which is absolutely okay. And of course, it has to be customer-centric. This is the key element of it. Going away from the system perspective more towards a problem perspective, we have this problem space and the solution space, we need to bring those much more together, much more closer together, but we focus on the customer-centric aspect. Like we did here in this very simple example, <laughs> because we thought, what's the problem we want to solve and what do they need to tell their people on the phone, right, the customers, the clients? They need to come up with the solution, with the calculation and the result of the calculation. That's customer-centric, that's absolutely okay. Because if we would have only thought about that, we would have created work packages for each system, but this is then creating feature breakdowns, right? And that's what we want to do. Going from work breakdown structures to feature breakdown structures, which is much more efficient. Yo, and in the end, there were some other questions they asked. Who is familiar with less, by the way? Okay. There's something called less and there's something called less huge, right? And in less huge, we have something which is called requirements areas. Less huge starts from eight teams plus, right? So that means requirements areas are from a customer perspective differentiations between, yeah, requirements. Domains, you could also call it. And they ask, why couldn't we have requirements areas with our five teams? I mean, there's a simple answer to that. It creates too much local optimization. That means everybody is focusing on his own part again, maybe on the three systems or on the only on the this minor little one problem, not on the entire use case, not on the end-to-end -end problem. So we don't want to have that unless if we only have five teams. We want to go away from the local optimization towards a global optimization. That's also the reason why we have one product owner where everything comes together. It's not that the one product owner is doing everything. Product ownership consists, and here it's called product ownership, it consists of all people involved here for clarification, for estimation, for splitting, etc., etc. But the product owner is the one with the last word so that it's consolidated and that this person can keep the overview, right? Yeah, of course, like I said, in this environment, we. Sure. I can give you two answers to that. The one nobody wants to hear and the one <laughs> which is pretty common. Uh, the one nobody wants to hear, if you're telling about a system or structure that which is too complex, the answer nobody wants to hear is make it simpler. <laughs> then the one person can deal with it. And that's exactly the goal in less. The other one is, uh, is a compromise answer. And I say, if there is such a complex system and you just started the journey, then make smaller areas because an area goes from four to eight teams, right? And then you have one requirement area with only uh, four teams, five teams, and another one, and probably another one, right? This is still too much local optimization. You should get rid of that somewhere along the road. But in the beginning, yeah, it's a compromise. Mm -hmm. You can. This becomes the leading team then. But you should uh, have your plan how fast you want to go to a real requirements area situation then. Of course, this is very often if a new market evolves, if a new product comes out or something like that, you create a new requirement area, you start with one team, which does the analysis and the experimentation, because this is this, there are so many variables out there. There's a new market, maybe a new technology, a new product. So we have to experiment with that. We have to create the hypothesis for that. And the first team is the one with the answers then in the end, and the others can follow the first team. This is the beginning, but it's not the goal, of course. Yeah. 
Welcome. So, um, what we also did was that this direct control of stakeholders towards development me um, team members stopped. So we really said, we have our planning, we have our rhythm, we can have uh, discussions, what is mo more important or not, but this direct involvement is just stopping here. And this was very important, very essential, right? Because otherwise you talked about a matrix, otherwise you have always this kind of matrix conflicts. And matrix is a conflict per se, from a structural standpoint, right? And of course also uh, the uh, approval process that changed to a more formal process, which is then in the end a checklist. So we have the acceptance criteria, definition of done, all the traditional scrum stuff. And if there's something else involved, like uh, we have this auditing, etc., then it's becoming part of the checklist. Yeah. Um, and they, and this is the funny part about that, they still have project managers, right? This is a compromise in the organization. Unless we don't have project managers in Scrum, we don't have project managers and we don't have projects. What they understand is not what we would understand as a project manager, is more that somebody is taking care of the budget besides uh, for a typical endeavor, for a typical project. Still, the product owner is consolidating all that, but this guy or this person is doing, we could call it nowadays controlling or project management assistance or something like that, right? They are having some kind of responsibility for that, but more in the sense of we're taking care of this container, of this budget container, and we're taking care of the controlling whether it, we run out of it or not. It's a supporting function, more or less, right? So we changed the structure there. Not fully, but at, at least a little bit. Sure. You can. Hmm? In this solution? Um, theoretically, yes. <laughs> In practice, there's there's so many consequences for the entire organization. To change it right now, I would say this is another five to ten years to change that. Yeah. Like I said, it's 220 years old. They have all this all they have all this this is not much time for such an organization. Seriously. Five to ten years. Yeah. Yeah, for people, even for people, if they are used to work there for 20, 30 years, five years for the next change, that's okay, I would say. <laughs> you mean we are more relaxed there or so? <laughs> mm. Yeah. It's not so common anymore, but it was, in, uh, and in such, um, in these industries, it still is, yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is now a little bit about the th uh, theory behind LESS, what we did. Um, we had, what is the important part for you here, I would say. This is the one which I mentioned in the beginning these overview sessions um, for the reviews. What we created there was something like, I mean, we invited stakeholders for the planning as well. So this is one of the things we did because, uh, but only stakeholders we knew they want, they are willing to help. Not those who want to uh, damage the whole journey, but those who are willing to help. We want to have them in the planning as well. And for the review, uh, what we did there was, uh, we did an overview in a large room like that. So everybody was there, the product owner for 15, 20 minutes, uh, minutes gave an overview of what was done in the sprint by all five teams on a meta, um, meta level, so on a, from a high level perspective. And then we created a map, like in this room you can go for this detail, in this room you can see this detail, in this room you can see this de detail, like a navigation system for everybody who was there, for the stakeholders. And then they were free to spread out and just go there what they were interested in. So we didn't do, we tried in the very beginning, we experimented with this bazaar situation, like we have a station there, a station there, a station here, a station there, and they can spread around in the room. It was just the, the infrastructure didn't support that. It was too noisy, it was, ah, people didn't want it. So we decided, okay, then let's try the other way. Let's go to the team rooms and you can hop on, hop off, to this presentation whenever you wanna you want to. Actually, we, we also tried 
Ja. Ja. But I wouldn't say it's not generally not working because I have very good experiences with the bazaar situation. It's just that you really need a room where the acoustic is good enough, right? If you hear everything that's spoken behind there, it's just disturbing, you know? Uh, you don't want to have that. You don't want to be louder as th this guy or that guy. <laughs> it's not a good situation. But if you have the infrastructure for a bazaar situation, like having different stations and giving the first overview together in, in the beginning, that's a very good situation. I, I like that a lot. But in this situation, we had to spread out and we went to team, room, team rooms, which also works very well. Because the good, one, the good thing is everybody gets together the same overview, the same pic uh, the big picture. But then for details, we really can decide where you want to invest your next 10, 50, 20 minutes. And you don't have to stay there for two hours or so. That's really a good, good uh, concept, I would say. So, pitfalls and lessons learned as a summary. Um, in the beginning, they weren't really brave enough to be fully transparent what's going on, which created some negative consequences in the end. So we had to repair that. Not everything was really made transparent. I would always recommend from the very first day on be as transparent as possible. Um, we had Scrum Master assignments to teams, which can be positive or negative. This, this, this can uh, turn out in both situations. Thank you. And we had, or we changed that actually to that. Uh, in the beginning, it was uh, there were three Scrum Masters with less than. And uh, we had one situation which really was a learning for them. I wasn't Scrum Master there anymore. This was a, co a colleague and some two, in uh, one of my colleagues and two internal Scrum Masters then. All three of them at the same day went to a team. And the team always asked the same questions to all three of them separately. And they gave three different answers. <laughs> so this is not really creating trust. So we had to. We did then this with assignment to teams and that everybody knows and much more uh, synchronization across the Scrum Master. We created a Scrum Master team as well so and did the plannings for the Scrum Masters in the same way as Scrum for development, right? Um, yeah, from component to feature teams as much as possible. And of course, this new product owner. If there's somebody new to the environment, nobody knows. Who is then making the final decisions for the product? This is hard to accept for many people. I would not recommend that. I would always look first internally and if really nobody is turning out to become, uh, who wants to become the product owner, then the next step would be to look externally. But for such a situation, I would not recommend that. Right. Good. And the room situation I mentioned already. So let's jump over that. I just want to give you the hint. Alexei already did. <laughs> there will be a less course in November. Yeah, you are happy about that, of course. Right. Scrum UA is uh, organizing that once again. I have the honor to be there as well, to be the trainer. So it will be November 27, 29. Who wants to learn more about less in Titus? <laughs> about system thinking and everything that's connected. The previous slide, you want to see that, of course. <laughs> Five minutes, I think we have enough time. Uh, the compromises we li had to live with was we still have these project managers, not in a traditional sense, but taking care of the controlling for budget containers. Uh, we still have a gremium in there, which is called Gatekeeper Gremium, uh, which is a board coming together, making roadmap decisions, I would call it, right? which is not contradicting it so much. It's just a little bit more than needed, actually. And IT operations is not fully involved yet. So these are the main compromises we had to live with. Not so much, no. Lean and Scrum. Lean is a... Uh, uh, Scrum uses much of Lean. So Lean is more like a foundation under Scrum, I would call it. And it's built on top of it. 
that's the most simple way to describe it, I would say. Because the principles, the 14 principles you have, the lean thinking house, etc., etc., you can all use that for Scrum, uh, which is very good. So lean thinking is very, very important to have. You have to have understood lean thinking actually to really become agile, I would say. What kind of? It has to come together. So there is no advantage over the other, I would say. I mean, for example, if you take one of the principles from Lean, grow leaders from within. This is something which is absolutely true for an organization that uh, implements Scrum in the end. Things like that. Or get rid of waste. I mean, this is very strong in less, definitely. So if you have the seven or eight wastes, whatever you, however you count it, you need to know that there is something which is reducing your value. And that's based on these kind of principles, on the lean principles. So there is no advantage. It has to cooperate. It has to come together for me. The first team was just with the with existing people, so they were there already. But there was some kind of fluctuation, and they hired new people and so on. So they had to learn as well. Yes. So it's it was a mixture of both. Absolutely. Yes. Good. Then thank you thank for you. listening. Maybe I'll see one or, or the other at, in November. <laughs>